You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul reminds us of the harlotry of the children of Jacob, who used the covenant of circumcision, a covenant of brotherhood, to kill their brothers. I am delighted to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Chapter 38 is about Judah, and I explained its function. So we'll go as quickly as possible, and that's what I'm going to do with the following chapters, especially the following chapters, because they follow a story, and we have to hear it in its entirety. So I'll be commenting on words here and there. Okay, the first son was wicked, a bad son, and please notice how at the end of verse 7, And the Lord killed him, or made him die. English has slew him from the verb moot. You see how God punishes. Again, people are always uneasy about that. But it will stay with us until the firstborn of David from Bathsheba, that the Lord smote. Okay, and that tells me again and again... uh, The Lord is neither good nor bad. He is the judge. And to our astonishment, when we are least expecting, he acts in a way that is good unto us. Okay? And from our perspective, he is good. But that is secondary to his being the just judge. It's very important. And notice the word that is used here, that he was, Ayer was a bad person. And then we all know the story of Onan, his brother, which gave our English onanism, where Onan was upset that he had to follow that tradition that becomes a rule later, which is the levirate, In other words, if a brother dies without progeny, and hence the importance of progeny, forget about ethics and sex. I can't stand Europeans with their being mesmerized with ethics and sex. Okay, forget about it. The whole business is the zera, the progeny. Okay, that's why the stress on a virgin that has a child tells you. Now, if you go to a nunnery, it becomes a big deal, and movie theater, and so on, and sex, and that's not the point in the Bible. That's not the point. The point is the procreation, and notice how the whole story will culminate with Judah ensuring his progeny that his sons were not able to secure. That's the whole story. You can make it in an episode in TV, or even a movie, so long as you stick with the topic. That is the whole issue. And I push it by saying, if it were not so, then Judah in Matthew would not have been the grandfather of Jesus. So you can't play games with that. To approach the text according to postmodernism, you have your questions to ask him. Well, the author is pulling your leg already. Because in verse 5, yet again she bore a son and she called his name Shelah. 
she was in Kezib from a root which means a lie. And Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar, which is very important because its meaning is date from a palm tree. Okay, the palm tree or the date, I mean. And the Lord in 10, he also slays Onan because he refused to secure a progeny. Okay, let's hear it. So when he went to his brother's wife, he spilled the semen on the ground, lest he should give offspring to his brother. In Hebrew is clear, Zera. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. Okay, so Tamar went and so on. And you know, the rest of the story, let's move. She prepared the way so that she could secure the funny thing about this story. So ultimately, she secured the seed of Judah. It's unbelievable. So the whole thing is about the seed. Here I remind you of my comments about chapter 34, which is taken by everybody, the rape of Dina. That's not the rape of Dina. The chapter is about the harloting of the children of Jacob against the covenant of circumcision. Can you imagine? They butchered their own brethren in circumcision. They used the covenant of circumcision, which is a covenant of brotherhood, to kill their brothers. That is what the chapter is all about. But this is classic in the Bible. Another example, and I would like to bring it here again. Like in the Sunday school, you read Jeremiah 1 and you tell the children, it is telling us about Nebuchadnezzar's besieging of Jerusalem. No, no, no. That's not what the chapter is about. The chapter is about the besieging of Jeremiah by the inhabitants of Jerusalem at the time of the siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, which means the siege of Nebuchadnezzar is a time frame, like in the second year of the famine. You're not talking about the famine, you're talking about something else. Please, friends, inscribe, etch this in your mind. Otherwise, you're not hearing scripture. You're hearing your own thing. And I'm convinced that it is because of that that the author, without entering into detail, it's a very thorny issue, it doesn't help our case here, namely, that the author is using to speak about Tamar, Zona, that would be the harlot, and the other one is Kudasha, which people try to translate a religious prostitute, temple prostitute. It's a big deal. I don't want to enter into that. Why? Because for me, this is a wrong approach to the matter, because Kadosh meant taboo. It is someone that is marked that you may not touch. Plain, simple, and thus it becomes clear to me that technically here, Judah did something that he was not allowed to do. Because a harlot is a harlot. You go and you pay her and you sleep with her. But the addition of Qadasha, it was something that was practically not to be done impossible, but God used his channel to secure the progeny. Now, the funny thing is that the Christian preachers, like that, when Matthew writes it, you see how God used harlot women in the genealogy of Jesus. 
Now, why in Matthew it's okay and here it's not okay? It's because you decide so. Because Jesus, you want to protect him somehow. No, Jesus doesn't need your protection. You need the protection of the God and Father of Jesus. Jesus doesn't need your protection. But this is what you do. You put him in a gospel covered with gold and silver and enamel, and you put a timer with a lock linked to the police station so that people would not come and steal your gospel. That's what you do. And this is condemned in Matthew 23, that you give more importance to the gold of the temple than the temple itself. We do this every time. And the ultimate expression of this is postmodernism that is held in all schools of theology, orthodox and non-orthodox alike. No way, Jose, during my lifetime. No way. And on the other hand, you have the play right from the beginning where the place where he met Tamar, which is the fruit, remember, it's the palm tree, it's the top fruit in the wilderness, in the oasis. With the name of the location, which is Enaim, which is the dual of fountain. Twice it is mentioned. 14. She put off her widow's garments and put on a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Enaim. And then, in 21, and he asked the men of the place, where is the harlot? Okay. And here harlot is Qadasha, the taboo harlot, who was at Enaim by the wayside. Repetition of what was said in 14. Again, once more I told you, and the author repeats, it is definitely intended and you know the rest of the story that she wanted to secure herself she didn't trust him and asked him in verse 17 for a pledge Arabon, that's a very important word i discussed it in my books pledge is very important you know in arabic we call the engagement Urbun, which means you put a pledge that is taken very seriously in the Middle East. If you break an engagement, it matters. It's not, it doesn't matter. It's a seal. Okay. And then notice it is connected with the signet and your cord and your staff. Again, one more time, shepherdism. But this Urbun Rabun is very important. And let me jump to the New Testament. That is why the spirit is linked with the transliterated word Arabon. You see how in the New Testament sometimes transliterate is very important. As I mentioned to you, the word church doesn't mean anything in the New Testament. You have to hear Ecclesia which you may still hear in French and Latin, but not in English and Scandinavian and German, which is a silly word to translate Ecclesia. You have Aravon and the Spirit. You don't experience fully except in the Kingdom. Until then, it's a pledge of the kingdom, assuredness of the kingdom. But it doesn't mean that you are there. And this is the silliness of how we deal with our saints by making the super saints already in the kingdom. 
and we ask them to pray for us and intercede. Are you kidding me? You can do that. You hope for righteousness. You await the Spirit. Okay? Spirit came at Pentecost. What did he do at Pentecost? He assigned apostles. How about the gospel? The business is not done at Pentecost. That's why in the rubrics, which I always respect, after Pentecost, you go back to the boring readings from gospel after gospel. In other words, theology fools you. Now we have the fullness of the Spirit. You don't have anything. You have to suffer and keep hearing the four Gospels that was produced by the Spirit that landed after 50 days. And the first fruit of that Spirit is Matthew that ends with go and make disciples of all nations and I'll be with you until the close of the age. Come on, friends. Please, be real. Be real and stop juggling with the Spirit as though he or it or she is a yo-yo in your pocket. Let me tell you what the Spirit does. I don't want you to tell me. I'll see what he has done when I see him having done everything, which means at the Lord's coming and not before. Oof, these are my blessed asides that tire me. But why do I do that? Because I don't trust my hearers. They give me the impression that they are listening to me, but they are not. Because if they would listen to me, they would go and hear tapes of scripture and not my podcasts. Aha! Uh -huh. I know Father Mark doesn't like that, but who cares at my age? Very important, friends. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.